Welcome to Just an Average Citizen, the podcast that helps to educate, inform, and empower you to make an impact in Abilene and the big country. I'm so excited you joined me today. This is not one full of a lot of information, but we're going to hit some things that you probably haven't really talked about before or been exposed to. So I'm going to stretch your brain in that way. And I'm so excited you joined me for this episode. As always, I'm going to request that you uh, subscribe and share this with your family and friends to get the word out because we are in days where we need to find honest sources of information. information. And I'm just shocked at how many people cannot recognize when they're being fooled because they just don't know the truth. And once we start learning where we can find sources of truth, we should always validate and verify what we're reading is true rather than trusting even um, hopefully resources like me that are trying to bring the truth in as balanced as a ways I, I know how. But I'm human and I have opinions and things that influence me. So I hope that you can navigate through that and you'll verify what I say to be true. And so I think it's fun that we're going to now go into this first part and talk about what I missed last week. You know, I told you a few podcasts ago that, or a few episodes ago, that I was going to do my best to bring the truth to you, to help you understand what I'm understanding, and not be afraid to get things wrong. Well, I am learning and growing, and besides running my household budget, I have not cared very much about any other kind of budget, much less budgets that require that have fund-based fun-based budgets, and I have grown leaps and bounds in this last year, but sometimes I still even miss it. So I just wanted to touch base real quick and clarify some things that I think I understood, but maybe didn't explain quite as well as I should have. So if you can look here on this first picture, we have a picture of the proposed budget. Um, I want to look at and help you understand that they kind of um, keep things pretty, pretty pretty standard. And I think I may have missed some of the reversal here and it may not be, but I'm just going to go with it and let you know where I have grown even more since I was teaching you last week about budgets. So what we have here is the actual budget. We have what was budgeted and the difference. And so what I want you to see is the actual budget was that they would have probably uh, be under budget or they would not have enough funding for the Hilton Abilene Downtown Convention Center they would be uh, $42,000 underfunded. So that means they would go into the whole $42,000. Well, the actual budget, they went um, below what was funded $526,000. So the difference is they were actually over budget or over they overspent $481,000. And so that's important. And I also want to point out here, it says the Hilton Abilene Downtown Convention Center. Does this mean the hotel? Is this just the hotel? Is just this this the convention center? These are the confusing things that don't make sense. So what we can look here is the 2024 proposed budget, and this was actually presented by the asset manager, to be fair, um, not the actual city finance person, Mike Rains, but this 2024 budget, they're expecting to have a two million, two point six million dollar over funded um, expense you know, they're going to be making over $2.6 million over their expenses. And so that's a good place to be in. But now let's go look at this next one and let me re-explain this one as best as I can. And you know, I'm not embarrassed (laughs) to have people point it out to me. And I am learning and growing just like you are. But I want you to be able to trust me that if I find something that I've said that is not accurate, that I'll come back and catch up within the next podcast or the next episode, depending on how long it takes for me to be made aware of my error. Because I am human and I make errors all the time, as does everyone. And so let's be real. We can't be perfect. We can't have all the information at the time. But when we have better information, we should be updating people and letting them know, hey, that I thought this was this, but it really wasn't. So now let's look here again. We have for 2023, the actual budget, which shows again, they are $475,000 over budget. So that meant they spent $475,000 more than what they actually had. They approved this budget, which um, showed that they were going to have $241,000 over. They, they thought they were going to have more money than they, than they did. They actually doubled it and went the wrong way under budget, or uh, not under budget. They were over over the revenue. They had more expenditures than they did have revenue, and that is 
a negative. So they're in the negative here. So the other thing that's interesting, and I mentioned that they expected a $3 million surplus next year or profit next year. But when you look at all the expenses, it actually shows that the proposed budget, the proposed budget at what they have right now is proposing that they're going to have $1.9 million more in expenditures than revenue. So even if they are going to have a good profit, the the money is not going to be there to cover that in the sum of $1.9 million. Again, it could change. And we're not at a place where they're like, that's crazy. $1.9 million. Let's call the press. No, that's not what this is. But it is an indication that if some things don't change, there's going to be some issues. And we want this hotel to succeed. We have now money invested in it. And it does no one any good to cheer on this anything but the success of this hotel. So we're going to have to work on it. I do know that they mentioned that they're now this year is the first year they're going to start accounting for depreciation. And again, that's, I understand what depreciation is, but I don't understand why they're accounting $2 million for it in this first fiscal full year. So let's keep our eyes on this and let's keep paying attention because these are the things we can start to understand when when they say, oh, we don't have money for this or we have money for this. You can wonder, you know, like to me, I'm thinking, um, you know, when we were watching or when I was attending the city council meeting, when they were talking about the um, the Abilene Youth Sports Authority flat fields that they're putting in and partnering with the private entity, because it is a private entity, the Abilene Youth Sports Association, that they are now, they were planning on it costing $5 million. But instead of it being $5 million, it costs $10 million. And so it was really concerning to me, and I'm still looking into this, trying to understand it, when on the campaign trail, and I believe a couple times through the year, that the money isn't there for a lot of extra stuff. So how is it that we magically came up with $5 million extra dollars for this Abilene Youth Sports Authority? I think the honest answer is there are priorities that there is money available for, and then there's priorities that they're not really interested in spending money for. So let's keep that in mind in the future when we have issues like bond elections or when we hear of things not being taken care of properly, we can look back and see, hey, there's there's been a path here that got us to this point and it just didn't happen overnight. And so we can be educated and informed to understand a little bit more about what happens on the uh, in the city budget level. But again, I apologize for making that mistake. I don't like to tell you when I make mistakes, but it's something I get to do quite a bit. And I'm honest about it when I do it. I'm not going to try and hide it or dismiss it or make you feel like it wasn't that big of a deal because I totally missed it last time. So here's the update and hopefully you can better handle what um, what comes along in the future. And so it's important to look at the titles up at the top and then look at what they were expecting to do. And they revise it throughout the year. And I'm thankful that I'm starting to see how that process works because they, when it says revise budget, it's not just one revision. They can make revisions all throughout the year and they present those at the city council and in the city council packet meeting, meeting packets so that you can follow along and track. Now you're not going to maybe be able to put it all into place as easily as maybe they can because they have all the information in front of them. But it is important that we um, are always paying attention and looking to see what's coming on. And so I'm excited. I'll tell you a little bit more about the, the city council workshop that I think they're having a retreat. I can't remember the title of it right now, but that is going to be another place where we can learn more information. And I'll, I'll talk to you more about that. But we have the opportunity to know what's going on. And that's what this podcast is doing is helping empower you to know where to look so that you can make better um, decisions on what you need to do. All right, so let's go ahead and move to the week in review. All right, the first meeting that we actually had this week, uh, there were quite a few meetings on Tuesday, and then the rest of the week was pretty quiet. And Tuesday was a big deal. I don't know if any of you got to come and see Governor Abbott. It was really fun. I got to bring my two younger kids, and, and it was just fun getting to meet him because, you know, he has... He's an elected official. He's someone of importance. And even if we don't always agree on everything that's happening, it's okay to be able to pause things and be able to celebrate that, you know, it's not often that the governor comes to Abilene, Texas. And it was really fun to get to meet him and hear him and know that he was doing a lot for different people all throughout the the state. And hopefully when um, these elections are over, we'll see if we have some different um, circumstances to work with, because uh, right now we're kind of in a quagmire of not really having an effective 
representation in our government because we are a Republican county, we're a Republican state, but yet the Democrats, you know, it's crazy that um, the Democrats have more control over things than they really should. And it's confusing and something we need to get to the bottom of. And so I'm grateful for the governor coming and letting us know what's going on. And that is a lot of off the cuff stuff that hopefully is not too off uh, in the weeds there, but let's talk about the first meeting that happened on Tuesday, which was at a, at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, it was the neighborhood services meeting. And I was thinking I was going to go to it. And then I ended up not getting to go to it. And sadly, they didn't have it recorded, but I'm getting better at reading their agendas. They had an agenda, they posted minutes. And let me make sure they posted minutes. I'm pretty sure. Yes, they posted minutes. And it was interesting in their minutes, they said at June 1st of last year was Their first meeting, so they had no minutes. So I was curious about that because this is one of the boards that I was like, huh, this looks like a really exciting board offering great things. But the more I look into it, it's it's really not, it doesn't make sense to me. So I'm still learning and you can learn along with me. So they had um, some slides, which I always appreciate because again, the agendas don't really tell us a lot, but then when they have these slides, we can look and see what's going on. And so there's two different organization or organizational funding that happens through the neighborhood services. And so that is the um, CDBG funding and the home funds. I wish I could tell you what the CDBG funding and the home fund stands for because that's an acronym. But basically, they're both federal programs that they offer to the city and the city takes advantages of it. And so some of the CDBG funding programs that are available are like the first time home prior. Oh, actually, that says that's home funds. The first time home buyer program is a home funds um, brand, um, program. Critical repair is CDBG funds. Neighborhood revitalization is CDBG funds. And single family rehab rehabilitation is home funds. And so these are our funds to help improve the the um, the neighborhoods and and for especially those who cannot, they don't have the budget to take care of it. And I think that's important. Um, And sadly, it seems like the requirements are so really high that it's really hard to get this money. So when we see that anyone got money is impressive, but it should, it shouldn't, it should, the threshold, that's a tension you have to walk in because you want people to actually be able to work to, to get the funding. But at the same time, if it's really difficult for people to get the funding in need, it doesn't seem to be something that's helpful. And I feel like this is a great opportunity for local community organizations to step in and start being the hands and feet of Jesus and helping restore some of this for our community because everyone wins in this situation when we work together with locals, with local organizations to do this. And that is something I would love to figure out how to do better, a, a better job of, because I know that it's through relationships that we improve our community, not just through getting funds to fix problems. So these are the different programs that I told you about. I'm going to slide down here and we're going to get down to the programs that they did during the fiscal year 2023. So one of the things I noticed about this program when they started last year is I didn't even know anything about it. I hadn't heard anything about the meetings that they had for. They didn't have a very good attendance. I mean, I was going to say 60 people all together. Um, that is off the cuff of my memory from last year. So I was really shocked that they would not have a better way to communicate. And again, I'm not sure why that is or what the incentive is to spend a lot of time and energy getting people there. Maybe because it's not been effective. They've not really pushed for it, but I know they're wanting more people to come and be a part of the conversation. So they actually, the CBDG funded program, so that's more organizational. It, it There's... This one is not necessarily individual. And as I watched the uh, the other, I believe there's one or two meetings, but it says it was June 1st. So I guess it was only one meeting where they talked about what they did with the Salvation Army. They were getting new awnings, I believe, and possibly windows. There was, um, and that cost $78,000. The critical repair program, there were some other things that was $266,000. The neighborhood revitalization is $150,000. The condemnation and demolition was also $150,000. And infill development is $123,000. So that's interesting to me. Again, not enough information to really go on. Why is this in, is this infill, infill development different than what they're doing within the city? Is this especially for different projects? I don't know. They don't really talk, and I, I didn't get to stay for the meeting. So I do like to see this condemnation and demolition because, you know, it costs money to tear down buildings, and especially when they're condemned and the people aren't even responding to 
to can to to tear them down or take care of it or if they're unable to then i believe this is where that funding comes in so interesting enough they had the first time home buyer program they were able to allocate thirty thousand dollars to different people in that area and then the rehab program which you know there's there's things that they're trying to do to bring things up to code um I was going to see if I wrote down notes on that. Yeah, they want houses up to code because a lot of times if your house is not up to code, you can't get the proper insurance. And there's just a lot of negative things that come along that. So if they can help get it up to code, then there's some benefits that come through maybe a, a better loan or all the different things. So it's important to get people up to code. Their community housing development was $73,000. Um, and uh, they gave to Habitat for Humanity. And I remember they discussed this, I believe, back in June at their last meeting and only meeting, which I don't know. So I think it's important here. What, it, you know, they want to know, it seems more than just these people who are um, potential applicants for these different programs. It says, what does your community need? What would you like to see happen in your neighborhood? What's specific to your area that you want the city to know? So I'm always about being a part of the conversation. And so I was really excited to see that this is a broader reach opportunity for us who are members of the community to recognize that they have different community meetings. And so they are all um, starting next week, which is interesting because i um, <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on next week. So there's one, there's two on Monday at two different locations, one in the morning at 10 and one in the evening at 6. There's um, two on Tuesday, one in the morning and one in the evening, and two on Thursday, one in the morning, one in the evening. And so I would encourage you, show up. And if you don't want to say anything, that's okay, but show up and see what it's about because we've got to start learning what it means to have input into our community. And so so this is a picture that I actually got because I thought I was going to say for the meeting and I didn't, and it tells you all the different public hearings and community meetings. And so again, there are two on Monday, two on Tuesday, and two on Thursday. One in the morning, they have it at the CB Daniels in the morning on Monday, Mockingbird Library in the after evening. On meeting two on Tuesday, they have it at Cobb Parks, uh, the Cobb Rec Center, and then the Cesar Chavez Rec Center. And then on meeting five and six on Thursday, they have it at the Cesar Cesar Chavez Rec Center and the Rose Park Rec Center. And so it says public hearings and community meetings. So that's us. That's you. So make sure you make plans to go and find one of those meetings. I would just encourage you to find one of those meetings you can go to. And if we can get, say, six more people in the mix, that's a better start than they had last time, I'm sure, because I'm sure that we were none of those people that attended last year. So this is when we get to have our voices heard and what's going on in your neighborhood and what are the needs? Are the roads a mess? Then let them know because this is a good place to start that conversation. Because we know they have street maintenance fees that they're collecting to help fix roads. And there are some really rough roads in our town and they're not being necessarily addressed this year. So let's get them on the docket for next year. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, this year. So let's get them on the docket. Or, you know, is there some code violations? I know that we've heard that sometimes it's harder to get code enforcement on the north side than it is on the south side. So let them know the places that are, you know, needing to be addressed. This is a great place for our conversation. So the next meeting that happened on Tuesday was the Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund Board Agenda. And again, there's no uh, recorded meeting. There's uh, minutes, which they're very, um, they're very minimal. They fit basically on two page, um, two pages, and most of it is not words. <laughs> so they reelected Kevin Johnson. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Kevin Johnson, something he he was um, the election of Kevin Johnson by acclamation to a three year term. I don't know what that term is as a trustee, I guess. So you have one, two, three trustees and you have different chairmen. So I don't know if the chairman are not. I mean, the uh, board positions are not or the uh, officer positions are also trustees. I'm not sure how this program works. So I'm still learning. So that was something that I was like, ah, I wish I had more information about and then I helped clarify a little bit. They decided that um, Baker Bryant would be the chairman again, and Corbin Barnett would remain the vice chair. And then Brian Yates is the city councilman who was appointed by the mayor. And so they talked about um, something to do with funding, and it is it is something I think I need to go to the meeting. But Tuesdays, I have stuff going on Tuesdays, and so it's really hard for me to want to step into that and give up the things that um, I've already got in place. And so, you know, I'm just an average citizen, so I'm going to make as many as I can and learn as much as I can about each board. 
Now, this next board meeting I was sad to miss. I really want to go to this board meeting, and I think I'll make the next one. I would assume they only have this board meeting when they have actually things to discuss because it's a Landmarks Commission meeting. And I'll just have to say I it's, it's a well-run board. They have great minutes. They have great discussion. And you can see here there is a full dais up there. Um, they went around and let every person introduce themselves and tell what part of the community they are from. And I loved it. It was so good to get to know their names and hear what they brought to the table on the board. And I will say this is a very well-qualified board. They have a lot of knowledge. And I think it'll be good used um, for, it will be for good use on this board. And so uh, one day I'll get to go. But of course, the mayor was here and I just missed it again. They only had one item to discuss on the agenda. And that was this building on North 3rd. Now, what it is, it's a, it's an old building. It was built in the 1920s, 1921 to be exact, and it has different storefronts. So I think there's four stores in this building, and what they're discussing is a new sign for this one right here that has no sign. It's not a new tenant or resident of that building. It's not a new business. They just want to put a sign up. And so they want to make sure it's in line with the age appropriate because it has um, it's in the central business district or it has a central business zoning, but it also has a historic overlay. And so that requires it to have, you know, they're not going to be able to put up a digital sign or something really flashy that isn't appropriate for the building. So this is a space they're looking at. I'm going to scroll down here to show you. So there were two options presented by the owner. They had this darker, and this is actually, they said was their logo and they wanted to put it above the sign. And then the second one was this different one. And basically, it's a different font. Um, the big discussion was how will attaching the sign affect the bricks on the building because it is a historic building, a historic overlay on the front. And it was pointed out that these signs were attached by silicone. And so then instead of attaching it through the mortars, they decided it had to be some part of a non-destructive way to mount these letters because they were individual just like the other sign was. And so they approved it. But what I think is really challenging about this is, again, we have to make sure that things are appropriate. But today, this felt like a little bit more of an HOA group deciding that I will only give you certain colors to work from. And even if those colors, there's colors that are appropriate, I'm not going to let you do it. So you saw that the building owner wanted it in black or gray. That was its two options. And guess what? They came up with a third one, <laughs> which I think is ridiculous. I mean, really, like it wasn't because it was a color that was wrong. Black is a neutral color. Gray is a neutral color. I think that is, you know, they wanted their big, their big request was that the sign did not go like this one where it went outside the building, which again, what does it even matter? Those letters aren't, it's not even going to probably be posted. If it was attached there, that, that make, make a difference. But if they wanted the, the letters to go outside, that's not a big deal. It's not looking tacky. It's not in neon colors. Again, I think this, this, this board overstepped their bounds. So they liked the, this, the, the, so the, the board approved that this was what they would have to do. Stay within these white, these white bricks and make the sign um, uh, where it didn't destroy the bricks when it was being attached. Perfect. Then they're like, but, you know, I just don't think that's really readable. I don't think that would be wise to put that color up there. You know what? We're going to require that it looks like the other so that you can read it better. Mm -mm, that's not their job. Their job is just to say, listen, this is reasonable. It's reasonable to have black. It matches the black awning. There's nothing wrong that stands out. There's not an unreasonable request, but this board took it into a, it was a 24 minute meeting. And I will say that most of the meeting was people to introducing themselves and then discussing the color choices that the owner wanted. Again, that's to me an HOA kind of type behavior. It's not what the board really should be deciding because it wasn't that it wasn't historic. They just didn't think that it was going to be good for the business. And that's not their job. So I hope that as we continue to work through these, we can see where we can stand up and say, listen, I appreciate that you um, don't don't think that I'm making a good choice, but that's my choice to make. And if I want to keep it black like my label or my brand, then I should be able to do that and not have someone tell me that it has to look like the white letters. Now, I'm not saying I don't agree. I don't think that black is a really a good choice color on this dark brick, but that's their choice and they can put it up there if they want to. And it was ridiculous, in my opinion, for them to decide that they had to change the color because um, they thought it was better for the, the business. Oh, well, it started off being you can't read it. And they're like, well, we want it to match the other two signs. And it's like, 
you know what, I bet if we zoomed in on these, they don't match exactly. And it just gets to where this is overreach in my opinion. So, but other than that, I really like this board. I think they have a lot of interesting conversations. And even this one was interesting, even though I didn't agree. And what's fun is even if I'd gone to that meeting, I wouldn't have had a say. It wasn't something people ask. Although I guess they did offer a public comment. I could have set up and listen, say, listen, I don't think you have the, the reach to be able to tell them what color they can use because it's not that the color's wrong. It's just, you just don't like it. And it's not because it's historically wrong. It's just you don't like it. So I don't know. I'm learning. And again, if I find that there's some reason why they do have that reach, I'm sure I'll hear about it and I will update you as that becomes um, available to me. All right. So let's go to the next meeting. That was a really short meeting. This next meeting is the Child Advocacy Center Board Agenda. And it said a special meeting. So either it was canceled and rescheduled. I'm not really sure. You know, it's hard to figure out. Sometimes I get emails that tell me meetings are canceled. And I don't know if that just means they just have happened and now they're canceling them because they've already happened or they were actually canceled. And uh, I don't have a lot of time to figure out all those nuanced details right now. So I'm just trusting that it was probably rescheduled based on what I've seen on other reports or other other situations. And so they didn't have, they did not have, um, yeah, they didn't have any uh, minutes to my not, yeah, they didn't have any minutes. There was their last meeting was for February 6th. And so that makes me think the meeting wasn't scheduled. So maybe this is an additional meeting. I'm not sure. They had awareness events discussion. And again, I have no information on that. And they told us when the next meeting was April 2nd. So I've written that on my calendar, which I love that they do that. So I can write it on my calendar and have it ready far before the city post it to the website or make sure it's there, which I'm pretty sure it's there. That's why I know about it. So some meetings are different in that capacity. This one, I think they've set them up for the rest of the year. All right. So that ends the week in review. Let's go ahead and move on to the week in preview. All right. This week has some exciting things happening. I mean, of course, we know 70% of Abilene has already voted in the primary election this year. But May, March 5th, uh, Tuesday, March 5th is the last day you can vote. And there are 19 different locations all over the big country that you can show up and vote. So make sure your voice is heard. It is important that we are involved in in showing up and voting because our voices matter, and this is a time where we do it. And if you say your voice doesn't matter, then you don't realize that actually you have a powerful voice that when you vote, it changes things. And so one of the first steps is to show up to vote. And the next step is to learn how to find good resources to help you become educated on what's going on. And there's a lot of different resources you can find about different candidates, different positions. And if you find a really trusted, worthy group that you can kind of look to to start your research from, I think that's great, like iVoter Guide or something like that. And you don't have to just sit here and take their word for it. Look it up. See why these people uh, are being selected to be recommended to be voted for because then you start to learn when you're being inundated with campaign propaganda, you can start to weed through the truth and find out what's really going on. But it's always good to be um, your own source of information. And so we start by asking others. And then as we grow and learn, we can learn how to do it ourselves. Anyway, so let's look at what's locally happening. So the first meeting that's going to be happening is on Tuesday, March 5th at 1.30. It is the Planning and Zoning Commission. That's an important one. And then we have on March 5th, also at 4.30, the board, Betty Hardwick Center Board of Trustees, which is at the Betty Hardwick Center. It's one of those I've not been able to attend. Then on March 6th is the Board of Building Standards. And then on March, um, and that's all for this week. So the thing that I'm most excited about, because I've never gone, I only heard about it last year and I was unable to attend because it was on a Tuesday, nor did I know that I cared about it. <laughs> so look how far I've come. So this is the uh, city council retreat. And we talked about this on the budget planning cycle where they had, they said they had this in February, but I guess it's really the first week of March, if I'm remembering correctly typically. And so this is on Friday. It's from 8.30 to 4. I'm not sure how long it will go, but I will be there. So please come and join me and we can hang out together and take good notes and enjoy the moment as citizens learning. I know that last year, all the candidates running for city council attended. And so it was a full house. I'm not sure who all will be there this time because it's an off year and there are no 
city elections because there are no challengers to Shane Price or Lynn Beard. So we'll see. It may be just me and the council, and that's okay because um, I've I've carved out time, and there will be an agenda packet you can look through so you can be prepared. And if you click right on here, there's agenda minutes, and it'll take you to the agenda packet, and you can look through there. And so that's really exciting to me on a Friday from 8.30 to 4 p.m., and that's all there is right now. It's a pretty quiet time because we know spring break is coming up for a lot of families, and school is going to be out for a week. And so a lot of good things are happening. And I'm just excited to let you know that tomorrow, all the campaign flyers, all the campaign texts should stop, but they'll probably continue to ramp out for the next 24 hours because they're trying to get those last few scragglers who don't know what they're doing or haven't decided on who they're voting for. They're trying to pitch their ideas. And so make sure that you're always looking to see before you get frustrated about where they're coming from. Is it from the campaign itself or is it from a political action committee? And if it's a political action committee sending you these in, this information, a lot of time, a lot of times they're a lot more direct and probably a little harsher or more harsh. Um, but if it's a political action committee, you cannot um, really associate that with a campaign itself because it's illegal for them to collaborate on what they're sending out. So, you know, I think there's a lot of frustration with a lot of people about how negative this has been, but we've just never had this much money. In fact, I believe it's over $1 million, uh, probably closer to $1.2 million that has been spent on this election campaign cycle alone on one candidate race. So if you can only, or one um the HD 71 race. So if you can imagine how much money has come through the the flyers and the text messages, and remember, those are only going to register voters that are actually voting. So if you're getting it, it means that you have been established as someone who will show up to vote. And so consider yourself someone who they're trying to convince of how to vote. Now, of course, I agree. I, I mean, I've said this before. I think it's funny that most of the people who are getting these flyers have a very strong opinion and have been doing the work to know who to vote for. But it's okay. We we have to, you know, take it in and stride and just be okay that that this information is being sent out because it is that big of a deal. So you're a big deal. And I hope that you know that you make an impact in Abilene based on how you live and how you respond and how you use your influence to bring about change in our community. So thank you so much for joining me this week. I hope you have a great week. So make sure you're putting yourself in places that will educate, inform you, and empower you to make sure you're making an impact in Abilene in the big country. Until next time.